Man does not simply observe reality. He is not outside of reality observing it from some vacuum. Man observes reality because he is a part of reality. Without the physical body, man does not exist qua man. The fact of the matter is that the body of an animal is made up of the same properties as the rest of the universe, and the only way for a man to sense, perceive, or conceptualize anything is by the fact that he too is an observable part of the universe, and he is limited to his nature. To go beyond his nature would be to go beyond the fundamental nature of the universe. This is most obvious at the ostensive observation of man. He has a mass. He takes up space in our visual field. He has a shape which involves a set of built-in tools to help him survive. His presence can block objects behind him. He is an object that knows he can hide objects behind him. He is the kind of object that knows he can hide objects in order to plan an assault, or a theft, or to wait for the right time to present a gift. He is the kind of object that can make plans years in advance. If you were to observe humans from a distance, like alien scientists observing the various life forms of Earth, it would be undeniable that the human being has a nature that is physically limited like all the other animals. However, it has an extraordinary advantage over the other animals because of its natural ability to reorganize nature by coming to understand nature, a process those aliens would also have had to have grasped in their past. By the nature of the universe and what it means to exist, everything must have an identity a property which interacts with other identities. As a product of evolution, human beings are no different from animals in regard to the fact that they have an animalistic nature. One, at its most ostensive, can be observed simply by looking at it, and, at its closest examination, appears to be a process of chemical interactions, just like the other animals. But, unlike animals, human beings seem to do something special with those similar features. If you want a purely philosophical exploration of this, I would suggest you go to the source material and read Introduction to Objectivist Epistemology, and subscribe if you want me to tell you about it in my next video. This, however, is going to be a look under the hood, and to see what happens when we see. In the last video in the Spiral Hypothesis of Teaching playlist, we explored light and how light is a particle, a photon, which is the way in which energy is carried from object to object in an electromagnetic field. From that video we can make a relevant observation here. One. The universe that we see comes to us one photon at a time, although many come at once. And two, there is no color in light. There is only different energies of photons, which means different frequencies, and different amounts in a given surface area depending on its original illuminance and your distance from the source. Turning to the mammalian properties that can interact with the electromagnetic spectrum, we can observe the nature of how photons interact with humans. The most important electromagnetic sense for human beings is sight. Some evidence shows that humans may even be able to detect the magnetic field of Earth, but even if that is true, it has gotten man nowhere in comparison to the sense of sight. Sight, the process, power, or functioning of seeing, specifically the physical sense by which light stimuli received by the eye are interpreted by the brain and constructed into a representation of the position, shape, brightness, and usually color of objects in space. So let us begin with the thermodynamics of the sun. As we learned from the last video, the color emitted from a black body depends on the temperature of the black body. The sun is a G2V star, with a temperature around 5,500 Kelvin, and therefore produces a nearly endless stream of photons whose frequencies range from ultraviolet to infrared. We would perceive this as white light because it affects every range of our vision. However, depending on the angle that the sunlight is reaching the medium of gas that we call an atmosphere, the color of the sun will appear to change. The more atmosphere the photons must travel through, the more red. The less atmosphere, the more white. When the photons reach our atmosphere, the small wavelengths like blue get scattered around the sky. All of the blue you see in the sky is formally trapped photons. I say formally because for you to see it, it had to leave the atmosphere and hit your eyes. When the blue light is removed from the white, the remaining sunlight that is coming in directly appears yellow. When the sun is setting, the thicker atmosphere scatters blue and green light, and this leaves the sunlight that travels more directly to appear red. But we discovered that this light is not actually red, or yellow, or green, or blue, or white, and definitely not black, but are in fact different amounts of energy that is being carried by the electromagnetic boson. 
If photons simply carry different amounts of energy to our eyes, what is it about our eyes and brains that make these colors? Human beings have single lens eyes, which by most standards is a very complex system. Animals like flatworms have eye cups which shield light on one side and allow light to enter the other side. One of those eyes faces dorsally and the other faces ventrally. The flatworm only detects the contrast between the amount of light it receives in one eye compared to the other and determines which way to swim, aiming for the darkness. Humans, on the other hand, can detect images. This is because the single lens works like a pinhole camera. Well, actually a pinhole camera works like an eye, but since a pinhole camera has less parts, it's an easier example. A pinhole is a preferably black hollow box with a hole the diameter of a pin in it. Light that travels perpendicular to the opening travels to the back wall and is absorbed perpendicular to the wall. Light that comes in from above enters the box say at a 45 degree angle and will thus hit the back wall from below at the same angle. The same is true about light that comes in from below. The light that comes into the box comes in from every angle and this leaves behind an upside down image of the scene in front of the pinhole across the entire back wall. This is what our eyes do and the discovery of that led to pinhole cameras which were used along photosensitive plates to make the first cameras. The exploration of the science of photography eventually led to a better understanding of how we see. The difference between the back of the pinhole camera and the back of the eye is that the retina is made up of cells which, by their nature, actively respond to light and darkness in order to begin the process of perception. That difference is huge and the complexity of those cells are complicated compared to the black paint that just doesn't reflect light. So let's go quickly through the diagram of the eye. The entire eye is surrounded by a strong outer sheath called the sclera. When the eye forms, there needs to be a way in which to move nutrients to the anterior part of the eye in order to form the cornea, the pupil, the uvea, and the lens. The method developing humans use is to invaginate the collagen barrier, which separates the vitreous humor from the rest of the eye. It creates a donut-like chamber called the vitreous membrane, and the canal it makes is called the hyoid canal. This canal allows the eye to form properly in the prenatal human. The hyoid artery regresses after the lens no longer needs it, and it remains as a remnant of your development, and a good check against robot replicants. The vitreous membrane is surrounded by the uvea. Towards the back of the eye, along the uvea, is the retina. The uvea controls the iris, which controls the amount of light that can hit your eyes, the sclera body, which controls the shape of the lens itself, and the choroid, which is the vessel that supports the eye's metabolic needs. As an evolutionary bonus, they are pigmented a dark color to absorb light and to block light outside of the pupil, and it prevents the reflection backwards towards the retina. Cats, dogs, and many other animals actually have the opposite, which is called a tapedum lucidum. The iridescent tapedum lucidum reflects light directly back along the light path, increasing the quantity of light with constructive interference. This is why animals' eyes glow in the dark at you, and probably one of the reasons Empedocles thought eyes contained fire. Human eyes also reflect light flashes, as seen in red eye photos. The red is due to not having a taped and lucidum. If your eye reflects white, it may be cataracts or cancer. The part of the eye we need to examine closer is the retina. The retina is made up of layers of different sets of cells. It is where the photoreceptors are located. The retina has two major zones, the macula, which is near the center of the retina, and is responsible for high resolution color vision when in good lighting, and the optic disc, which is where the neurons leave and the blood vessels go, leaving a blind spot. If you want to test your blind spot, pause the video in a moment and cover your right eye, and with your left eye, stare at the cross. Move your head back and forth until the circle disappears. Pause now. Around the macula and the blind spot is the rest of the retina. The majority of the retina is covered by photoreceptors called rods. Rods are very sensitive to low intensity light and can respond to as little as one photon. The macular part of the retina has cone photoreceptors as well as rods. The cones are less sensitive to low levels of light. However, they are responsible for high acuity color vision. Both rods and cones contain roughly the same features such as synaptic terminals, an inner segment that houses the nucleus, the endoplasmic reticulum, and mitochondria, the powerhouse of the cell, and an outer segment that houses the plasma membranes that contain the light-sensitive equipment. 
The rod is similar to how plants collect light with photosynthesis, where discs are stacked one on the other inside of a membrane in the cell. Cones, on the other hand, are more like morpho butterfly wings that look like little combs. Within the lipid membrane of the rod's discs and the cone's plasma membranes are the major proteins and enzymes needed to effectively respond to light. Starting from the top, light that enters the eye hits the retina. The light passes by the majority of the retinal layer until the photon reaches the discs or membranes where it can interact with a molecule called retinal. Retinal is a derivative of vitamin A, which is one half of a beta carotene, and this is capable of interacting with light. When the molecule absorbs the photon, it changes shape, and this forces the protein called opsin, which holds the molecule, to also change. Humans have four, nine, but that's for a later day, types of opsin. Rhodopsin, which is in rods, and three types of cone pigment opsins. The cones are divided into large, otherwise known as the L cone or red cone, which has an absorption maxima, lambda max, of approximately 557 nanometers. A medium cone, also known as an M cone or green cone, has a lambda max of approximately 527 nanometers, and the small S cone or blue cone with a lambda max of approximately 420 nanometers. These opsin that surround the retinal hold on to the molecule, and when a photon within the absorbable range reaches the opsin, the 11 cis retinal molecule gets excited and straightens out, which causes a change in the opsin. This change activates a G protein called transducin, which makes the transducin drop a GDP and pick up a GTP, which causes a part of the G protein to split off and wander around until it hits a PDE, which is an enzyme that likes to break things. And so with its activation, it breaks the C off the CGMP. Without any CGMP, the cell membrane gates close and the cell becomes hyperpolarized. The hyperpolarization of the cell is proportional to the intensity of the light hitting the entire cell. The final result is a decrease in the glutamate release from the photoreceptor's synaptic terminals. The synaptic terminal is where the cell releases chemical signals to the rest of the body. The photoreceptors are the first part of the retina to activate, caused by their ability to absorb the light with their millions of opsin, and the rest of the retina looks like this. The synaptic terminal of the photoreceptor sends signals to bipolar cells and horizontal cells. The horizontal cell receives information from multiple photoreceptors, which creates a receptive field which will continue to pop up as we move towards the back of the brain, so let's take a moment to understand what is going on here. Imagine that we have nine cones connected to one horizontal cell, and each cone is attached to their own bipolar cell. If we bunch them together into a square or a circle, we are going to get a middle object. If we give each cone cell a value, we can get an idea of how the horizontal cell creates what is called a center surround receptive field. When the opsin are in complete darkness, they are depolarized, meaning they become less negative, and release glutamate, a neurotransmitter. This neurotransmitter glutamate transfers signals to other neurons, hence the name neurotransmitter, which in this case is the horizontal cell and the bipolar cells, of which there are two types. In the dark, all nine cells will release glutamate, and this will cause the horizontal cell to depolarize. When a horizontal cell becomes depolarized, it in turn releases an inhibitory neurotransmitter, which slows down the release of the excitatory glutamate. This is the default state of the retina. If we simplify this to a 2D comparison of the three middle cones so that we just have three to work with, we can reduce this down to a simple diagram. And on to further simplify things, we will only deal with on-center, off-surround receptive fields. There are also off-center, on-surround receptive fields, which work the same but opposite, as well as on-off groups, which is way too much at this point. In dealing with only on-center, off-surround receptive fields, we have our default situation of having both in the dark, meaning we have three more to explore. What happens when light is hitting both the on-center and off-surround cones? What is happening when light hits only the surround? And what happens when light hits only the center? Full light. When light hits the entire receptive field, then all of the cones become hyperpolarized, or more simply, they become more negative and release less glutamate. Since all of the cells are providing low levels of excitement to the horizontal cells, then in return it provides low levels of inhibitory feedback, which allows all of the neurons to release a little more glutamate. 
This is the opposite effect of the complete darkness state, center lit. When light only hits the center of the receptive field, only the center cone becomes more negative and releases less glutamate. The surround, which is more numerous, continues to release normal levels of glutamate. These high levels of excitatory glutamate cause the horizontal cell to release high levels of inhibitory feedback. This inhibition to the cones turns down all of the cones, but especially the center, which is already low because it is hyperpolarized. This leads to a very noticeable dip in the diagram. This is the lowest level of glutamate release from the center cones, and it creates the most excited response from the on bipolar cells. We are also ignoring off bipolar cells today. Surround lit. When the light only hits the surround, all of the cones except the center become more negative, and therefore, the surround releases less glutamate than the center. The horizontal cell is receiving less excitation, and therefore releases lower levels of inhibitory feedback. This allows all of the cells to release a little extra glutamate, especially the center, which was already greater than the rest. This is the maximum amount of glutamate release from the cone, and therefore the lowest excitation for the on bipolar cell. The responses that are generated in the bipolar cells are collected by amerkin cells, which come in many forms and sizes and make their own receptive fields, with the information passed on to them from the bipolar cells. The horizontal cells appear to detect edges, where some of the amerkins have elongated receptive fields to detect motion. The amerkin cells give this information to the ganglion cells, which cause a number of action potentials based on the amount of glutamate it releases. That signal is then sent to the brain via the optic nerve. The optic nerve is just a bundle of ganglion axons traveling parallel to each other in what is called a retinotopic mapping. The ganglion cells make their way to the lateral geniculate nucleus, which happens to have more receptive fields. After that, the signals then go to the striate cortex at the back of the brain, and again, we can find receptive fields. A pair of neuroscientists, Hubel and Weisel, in the 1950s discovered four commonalities between the retinal ganglion cells, the lateral geniculate nucleus, and the lower layer four neurons of the striate cortex. One, at each level of the receptive field in the foveal area was smaller than those in the periphery. Fovea mediates fine-grained vision. Two, all the neurons had circular receptive fields. Three, all the neurons were monocular. That is, each neuron had a receptive field from only one eye. Four, the receptive fields comprise an excitatory area and an inhibitory area separated by a circular boundary. Unlike the neurons that Hubel and Weisel found commonalities between, there are a few more that do not fall into that category. These are the simple cells and the complex cells. Simple cell receptive fields are straight lines rather than circles, and responds maximally when straight edge stimulus is in a particular position and in a particular direction. Complex cells are more numerous than simple cells. They have larger receptive fields than simple cells. They act continuously as particular positions in particular directions move across the field. Whereas simple cells are static. The complex cell is binocular, meaning they can respond to stimulus from either eye. Simple cells are made up of bars of receptive fields, and thus a bar of light that fits within that field are maximally excited, whereas any rotation from maximum pushes the bar outside of the excitatory region into the inhibitory region which cancels the excitation of what is remaining inside the bar's receptive field. Complex cells also respond best to bars of light in a certain orientation. However, it is the movement that excites the complex cell, whereas simple cells just respond to the presence of illumination differences. A third type is the end-stop cells, which respond to moving bars of a specific length and corners and edges. The retinotopic projections from the retinal ganglion cells holds the organization of the retina in such a way that the entire visual field corresponds to a small patch of the cortex, which altogether makes a binocular visual field with some overlap. These small patches are 2 by 2 millimeter chunks of cortex, called cortical modules. These chunks are made up of two complete sets of ocular dominance columns, 16 blobs, and, in the cells between the blobs, a complete sampling twice over of all 180 degrees of possible orientation. From these cortical modules, the visual information that leaves this part of the brain flows into streams. The dorsal stream, which analyzes visual motion, 
in the visual control of action, and the ventral stream, which is involved in the perception of the visual world and the recognition of objects. Simply, the dorsal stream is the where, and the ventral stream is the what. Let's quickly run through the anatomy and get to the fun effects of this system. The eye is a complex pinhole camera that uses four types of photoreceptors, which when stimulated activate their neighbors in an antagonistic way as to better distinguish between contrasts. These various types of large, small, black and white and colored base receptive fields go to the lateral geniculate nucleus, which divides into six layers, where layers one and two contain large neurons compared to three through six, and house the magnocellular cells, which are necessary for the perception of movement, depth, and the small differences in brightness. Layers three through six contain smaller parvocellular cells, which is necessary for shape and color. Under and between each layer is the conical cellular cells, which are necessary for blue color. Each layer has its own center surround receptive fields, which piece together the visual information into groups based on the neurons delivering them. The LGN is the first stage in the visual pathway, and only 10% of its inputs are from the retina. The other 90% are modulatory inputs from the cortex and the brainstem, meaning that the LGN is the first stage in the visual pathway that can be affected by cortical top-down feedback signals. These signals then go into the striate cortex, where they are again separated into different layers, this time nine. The different layers of the LGN go into their respective different layers in the striate cortex as well, but then that information is blended together in layers two and three, where for the first time in this system, information from the left and right eye meet, and yet there remains considerable atomic segregation between the layers. These segregations can be seen on the cortical module chunk. Yeah, fun, 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 fun! So, what's the fun part? Let's start with the eyes. We have already talked about your blind spot, which, with the rest of our knowledge, we can observe that your blind spot is not a missing part of your visual field, meaning the top-down functioning of your visual processing acts to smooth out the area. Another interesting aspect was discovered by our friend Thomas Young in 1802, and his work was refined in 1852 by Hermann von Hemholtz. This theory being that there are three different kinds of color receptors, each with different proportions for detecting different wavelengths of light. Recall that Young a year later would go on to describe light as a wave, meaning biology and neuroscience influenced physics. The theory is derived from the observation that any color can be made by a mixing together of three different wavelengths of light in different proportions provided that the original three cannot be made by a mixing of the other two. Why three? Because that's all we can see. Hence it must be because we have cones for three different wavelengths of light. Red, green, and blue, the primary colors. This means out of all the millions of colors we can see, it is made up of a combination of red, green, blue, black, and white. But these photoreceptors get tired, which gives us the next theory. The opponent process theory was proposed in 1878 by Ewald Herring, which states that three classes of cones encode two complementary color perceptions. This was based on the observation that there is no such thing as bluish yellow, or reddish green, or blackish white. There is evidence of the opponent process on all levels of the retinal geniculate striate system, such as cells that respond to motion in one direction. To test the color opponent process yourself, look at this inverted color of the American flag. Fixate your gaze at the center of the flag, and I will flip the screen to white in 15 seconds. Notice how the color inverts. This is due to the color opponent process. In this case, your cones start to bleach and cannot function properly until the opsin's retinal is returned to the 11 cis type. In short, you wore out certain cones in certain regions by looking too long. So, for the red of the flag, your green and blue cones were bleached out, leaving only red working. So when you look at white, you are receiving red, green, and blue light, but only the red one works. How long it takes you to see white tells you how long your eyes take to on bleach. If it takes too long, eat some carrots. No guarantee that will help. Something similar to the opponent process works outside of color too. Take this example of a spiral spiraling inward. Fixate on the cross and try not to follow the motion. And in 15 seconds, I will give you an image to look at.
Did you see the image moving the opposite direction from the spiral? That is because your brain adjusted to the motion, and when it stopped, the opponent process took over. This ability to remove a constant stimulus seems to be due to the nature of animals, and that they can only process so much information, that anything novel will capture your attention, but that novelty runs out quickly so that the animal doesn't get distracted by an illusion, something chickens have yet to evolve. Remember that part about how the LGN is where vision makes the first stop? Well, LGN is located in the thalamus, a part of the brain responsible for motor signals, consciousness, sleep, and alertness, and it is the relay to and from the sensory system. It is found near the amygdala and the hippocampus, meaning that your brain can be affected by the emotions and memories of your visual scene before the visual cortex gets to see it. For instance, should reach your LGN first which should have led to a fright before you were completely sure what it was. But in order to be afraid of it, you have to know it is something, let alone something to be afraid of, meaning that your knowledge of objects, which is located in the ventral stream next to the hippocampus, amygdala, and thalamus, can provide a fear response before your rational brain regions need to actively engage in a plan. You can see this with how color is used to affect your mood and products. Colors tend to come with objects that affect our moods for objective reasons, like red is blood and fire. Therefore, it is something our brains are drawn to for reasons of self-interest. And so, a good logo will use that to get your attention. Or, maybe a director will use a filter on their movie to force an emotion on you. One more, if we move to the striate cortex, we have one last top-down perceptual effect that provides, I think, the best evidence that what we know influences what we see. Without the striate cortex, we would not see color at all. It is here that color is invented for the purpose of perceiving the various photon energies. Therefore, if we are aware of what a color is supposed to be, we cannot really change that. Have a look at these strawberries. What color are they? If you said red, you are wrong. These strawberries are gray. But your brain knows that strawberries are red. Bananas are yellow, even if the wavelength you are receiving from them is not. This is how the shadow optical illusion works. Your brain has looked at what it expects to be a real scene, and it sees a shadow. And like removing the spiral motion from your attention, it removes the effect a shadow would normally give. But that shadow isn't real, and is not superimposed on that tile, and happens to be identical to the tile outside the shadow. One more example. The blue and black or white and gold dress. This is another example of color consistency in your brain's ability to remove what it believes is the correct lighting in order to see colors correctly. If we had a banana for color scale, our brains would interpret what color the banana is supposed to be and filter out the lighting until it was correct, in which case we would see a black and blue dress. The problem is that some people view this dress from inside the store, which is not where the photo was taken but whose interpretation does get the right answer. By thinking you are inside the store, the brain removes the yellow tint from the fluorescent lights. In removing yellow, the color opponent is blue, and you are seeing a blue dress. Now, if you thought this image was taken from outside, as it was, then your brain removes the bright white sun and the blue sky from affecting your reflectance. And in removing blue, the color opponent is yellow, or gold in this case. Man's ability to perceive through a sense of sight is similar to a lot of animals. In fact, most of what we know about our brains first came from non-human animal research, and later confirmed to be true for humans too. So this raises an interesting question. To what extent do humans differ from non-human animals? We can begin to see it in the color constancy. In fact, there are also size and distance constancies, where these lines are equal in size but appear different. Shape constancy, where we know this door is not shrinking in the x-axis. Location constancy, where you perceive a parked car as stationary as you walk. And object constancy, where we can recognize objects. Not all animals can do all of these, and the biggest difference appears to have to do with the ability to abstract or separate a certain aspect of reality from all others. And this is what we will discuss next time.